Tonight is a very, very special night because it is an opportunity for us to celebrate recovery and to share our successes with our elected officials on stage so that they may better understand the importance of access to treatment and all that that implies. We're going to begin tonight's program inviting Avriel Jacobson onto the stage. Avriel serves King County as its children's mental health planner. Her family is Eastern Band Cherokee and Mississippi Choctaw. She is an elder and a council member of the King County Native American Leadership Council, and she has a very important reminder for all of us. Come on up to the stage. Thanks, Neo. Osio, Osta Ika, Aya Oni and Wea, Aya Oni Gilohi, Aya Alise de Yamuya. Good evening. It has been a traditional custom for centuries in many Native American communities and among Native nations to begin all gatherings with an acknowledgement of whose land we are on and to express our thanks and appreciation. I would like to acknowledge we are on the traditional, unceded, ancestral lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe, Wado. Thank you, Avriel. Welcome legislators, other elected officials, special guests and community members to this 23rd annual celebration of our community's commitment to recovery and advocacy. We'd like to acknowledge and thank the 57 co-sponsors of this year's legislative forum. These are the people that make this thing happen. This includes provider agencies, health plans, advocacy organizations, and many other community partners. Thank you, co-sponsors. Let's give them a round of applause. We're going to meet the legislators on stage in just a moment, but as we get started, we would like to acknowledge some other elected officials who have joined us in the audience tonight. Kindly hold your applause until the end. Judge Johanna Bender, Judge Ketu Shaw, Judge Elizabeth Burns, Judge Rhonda Lawman, and City of Bellevue Council Member Jeremy Barksdale. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Legislators, I would like to go through uh, and, and get each of you to say quickly who you are, what district you represent, and the communities that you represent. And just, uh, just very briefly, we'll have a chance for questions later. Let's start at the end where there's a microphone. And that would be... Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and away we go. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Noelle Frame. I'm the state representative for the 36th district. You're sitting in it right now, so welcome to the 36th. Um, our district encompasses the C uh, northwest corner of the city of Seattle. We have um, part of South Lake Union, Belltown, Queen Anne, Inner Bay, Magnolia, Ballard, part of Finney Ridge, um, and Greenwood, Crown Hill, Loyal Heights. That's a lot. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi, my name is Mia Gregerson, and I represent the 33rd Legislative District, which is uh, the communities of Burien, SeaTac, Normandy Park, Renton, Kent, Unincorporated, and Des Moines. I'm Bob Hasegawa, Senator and General Cookie Monster for the Senate. Uh, I represent the 11th Legislative District, which is a little bit of South Seattle, the Soto area and Beacon Hill, uh, South Park, Georgetown, Tukwila. Hey. Yeah, and shout out. Tukwila, uh, Renton, and unincorporated King County. Thank you. Good evening. I have the honor of representing the 33rd Legislative District. I'm Tina Orwall. I'm the seatmate with Mia. We share the same area, which includes a bit of South Park as well as the other areas in SeaTac and surrounding the airport. 
Good evening, I am Claire Wilson, Senator in the 30th Legislative District, and that covers Algona, Pacific, Milton, a little bit of Des Moines, unincorporated Auburn, and all of Federal Way. Frank? I'm Frank Chop from the 43rd District in Seattle. I'm Senator Patty Cooter from the 48th Legislative District. I get to represent um, the best parts of Bellevue, Redmond, and Kirkland. <laughs> <laughs> and also all of uh, Yarrow Point, Hunts Point, Medina, and Clyde Hill. Hi everybody, I'm Mona Doss. I'm Senator from the 47th District, which includes Kent, Covington, and Auburn. And it is an honor and pleasure to be here with you tonight. Good evening everyone, I'm Roger Goodman, representative from the 45th Legislative District, which is uh, Redmond, Kirkland, Sammamish, Duval, and Woodenville. Good evening, Bill Ramos from the 5th District, which is the very eastern part of King County, Issaquah, all the way to Snoqualmie Pass, and north and south up to Duval, the north and to the south down to Black Diamond. We've got Maple Valley, uh, Carnation, Snoqualmie, North Bend, seven cities, and all wrapped up with half the district is rural, unincorporated King County with the seven cities in between. Good evening, I'm Tana Sen, state representative from the 41st District which is the top of Renton, Mercer Island, Newcastle, Bellevue, Issaquah, Sammamish, and Beaux Arts Village. Good evening, I'm Reuven Carlisle, a state senator for the 36th district right here, welcome. Hello, Jerry Paulette, state representative from the 46th district, which is Northeast and North Seattle from Husky Stadium up through Lake Forest Park and Kenmore, and I see our council member elect from Kenmore, Karina File, here. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Saldana, State Senator of the 37th Legislative District. It includes Central District, Beacon Hill, International Chinatown, the stadiums, Rainier Valley, um, Unincorporated Skyway, and Downtown Renton. Hi, I'm Joe Fitzgibbon. I represent uh, the 34th District, which is West Seattle, White Center, Vashon, and Burien in the State House. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shelly Clova. I represent the 1st Legislative District, which is centered around Bothell, has all of Bothell and Briar, parts of Mount Lake Terrace, uh, northwest corner of Kirkland, and a lot of unincorporated South Snohomish County. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Macri and I represent the 43rd Legislative District, which includes several neighborhoods in, in Seattle, including downtown, South Lake Union, Capitol Hill, First Hill, Madison Valley, Madison Park, Mount Lake, um, University District, Wallingford, Fremont, and a bit of Finney. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Jean Cole Wells, King County Council Member District 4 which goes from downtown at Madison Avenue on the north, north side up to 145th, the boundary with Shoreline, and from the water over to I-5, about 250,000 plus constituents. It's a little part of East Lake that's not in the district. Good evening, my name is Sharon Tomiko Santos. I'm very proud to represent the most diverse legislative district in the state along with my state senator, Rebecca Saldana. <laughs> uh, we, uh, in, I'm just gonna mention a couple of the neighborhoods that didn't get mentioned. Pioneer Square, First Hill, uh, Mount Baker, Rainier Beach, Rainier uh, Valley, and um, I think that's it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lauren Davis. I represent the 32nd Legislative District, which includes North Seattle, Shoreline, Linwood, South Edmonds, West Mount Lake Terrace, and Woodway. Good evening. I'm Eileen Cody from the 34th District. I'm in the House, and I represent West Seattle, Vashon, and Burien, White Center. I'm Joe McDermott. I serve on the King County Council. I um, live in West Seattle, represent parts of five legislative districts. Just think of them as the best parts of King County. <laughs> Thank you. We want to acknowledge several legislators who couldn't be here tonight, but who have sent representatives uh, they've got their legislative staff who are present here tonight. We thank you for coming. Uh, the staff of Senator Maria Cantwell and Representative Deborah Entenman from the 4th District. A big round of applause for all of our legislators and staff this evening. Our first speaker tonight 
is a true friend of treatment and recovery. As senior advisor to Executive Constantine, he's responsible for managing all of the King County Executive Departments, including the Department of Community and Human Services, by the way, they are our host for the evening, and for coordinating key policies and strategic direction for the county. He's Seattle born and raised and began his career as a legislative assistant to former Representative Jim McDermott. He's a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation and he helped establish Cherokee Nation's first Washington, D.C. office, serving as the nation's lead advocate before Congress and federal agencies. He was a senior member of U.S. Senator Patty Murray's legislative staff, advising the senator on housing and community development and tribal affairs as well. He is passionate about working to ensure our most vulnerable residents are able to connect to programs and services that they need to achieve healthier, safer, and more productive lives, and to improve access to health and behavioral health services throughout the region. Please welcome Chief Operating Officer for King County Executive Dow Constantine, Casey Sixkiller. Good evening. Okay, that was lame, you guys. Good evening. All right, there we go. Uh, I want to start by uh, saying thank you, Neil, for that introduction, for all you're doing uh, to promote recovery for people nationwide. Every bit makes a difference, and you're helping lead uh, the charge. Uh, I also want to thank, add to the list of acknowledgments of elected officials, uh, King County Council Member Claudia Balducci, who's here someplace. She's also the chair of our budget committee right now, so uh, if you have an ask, she's the person to see. It's maybe why she's hiding off stage. Uh, County Executive Dow Constantine is very sorry he couldn't be here tonight, but I am delighted to be able to step in uh, for him and join all of you uh, and welcome you tonight. I want to welcome our state legislators. It's not often you get to put the state legislators on a stage and rope it off so they can't leave. Uh, so thank you for coming back year after year and for all of your work. I also want to welcome all of our service providers and our community partners and a special welcome to all of you that are in recovery now and to your friends and family. Thank you all very much for being here. Now, King County government has been responsible for coordinating publicly funded mental health and substance use services for our region for nearly 30 years. It is a responsibility that we take very seriously, and it's one that we work every day to make sure that we are improving and meeting folks where they are. In 2018, King County served nearly 93,000 people, providing a variety of behavioral health treatment services and supports. 20% of those 93,000 were kids and young adults. We're committed to finding ways to improve access to treatment and to ensuring the best quality of care for our residents. For example, over the past two years, we have more than doubled the number of locations to access medication-assisted treatment to combat our opiate addiction crisis. We're implementing new programs to reach out to people in our county jails, in our shelters and encampments to offer these life-saving treatment services. We're working to fund programs and services that connect people, not just to behavioral health treatment, but also to primary care, homeless and housing assistance, employment, and most of all, connections to community. Our vision is for an integrated health care system where people can get the treatment they need when and where they need it. It is one of the many reasons King County continues to champion Affordable Care Act enrollment. Because we know that good physical and mental health is vital to leading a successful life. 2019 has been a big year for us here at King County. In King County and across the state, how we deliver Medicaid-funded services has changed. The integration of physical and behavioral health into one coordinated system of care. 
The state legislature mandated this change, and that's a good one, for a very simple reason. The mind and body are connected. On January 1st, 2019, King County joined with our other King County Behavioral Health Provider Network to form the King County Integrated Care Network, or as Kelly Namora will tell us in a few minutes, we call it kicking in. Our goal is a whole person approach that responds to the individual needs of every person. To do that takes partnerships, collaboration, and money. The last few years, the legislature, led by many of the folks sitting on stage here tonight, have made advances in making a down payment and funding these critical services in our communities. Thank you to all of you. Let's give them a big round of applause for their work. I know the stories you hear tonight are going to continue to give you incentive and the examples you need for your colleagues to continue that important work down in Olympia when you come back together at the beginning of the year. We applaud the call for more community treatment rather than inpatient hospitalizations, but the money's got to follow that promise. Our message tonight is clear. Prevention works. Treatment is effective, and people recover. That is our theme. We are celebrating recovery tonight. And I think we all know that any one of us that has either experienced ourselves or seen a loved one or a member of our community uh, experience um, substance abuse of any kind, is you know it's, it's a team sport. It's not an individual sport. It requires a whole network of friends and family and key supports. Money, yes, but at the end of the day, it requires the people around you to help you get through those dark days. Tonight, we get to celebrate those who are going to tell us about their journey um, and also be joined by so many friends and supporters here in the audience tonight. And I want to give a special shout out to our providers and to SEIU 1099. SEIU 1099. 1199. Sorry, uh, who represents many of these professionals providing this work. So thank you very much for being here. Um, as I said, tonight in a few minutes you're going to hear some of the stories from our, our community members. Their stories are powerful. They are the reason this work is so important. And I'm so thankful you all here and look forward to joining you on this important work as we move ahead. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. You know, an important part of what we are doing tonight is helping to reduce the stigma associated with addiction and mental illness. If you feel comfortable, I would like to invite you to stand or raise your hand if you are in recovery. Oh, wow. I love it. Now please stand or raise your hand if you know someone in recovery. Next, I would like you to stand or raise your hand if you have lost someone to mental health or substance use disorders. We honor them tonight, and we thank you. Please take your seats and give yourselves and each other another big round of applause. All right, coming up next, we have a recovery profile video featuring Cooper Moore sharing his story of recovery. I'm a 31-year-old white guy. I'm gay. I, uh, at this point, I identify mostly in my recovery personality as someone who is a dancer, um, who also does other kinds of things. It's my dancing. Um, and really, it's that uh, breadth, depth, and warmth of community that I have made with people I dance with. That's where I get you know, my connection with people, my friendships. Um, my play, 
Uh, and that's really where I develop a growth mindset. Um, I go and I spend some time studying it, I spend some time practicing it, and then I go out and I play at the social dances, and you get those moments that are just divine. You laugh, you say thank you from your heart, you see people and you're just like jazz to be there. As I developed and matured into you know, the social dancer that I am now, I've found that the things that eluded me in the recovery communities um, were really present in dancing. And that's really just a matter of that, like this well-made shoe of recovery was not one that happened to fit the person trying to get into it. Starting off with, you know, initial drug use, I could tell pretty quickly that this was not the path that I wanted to go down with my life. But addiction is, you know, a, an all-encompassing powerful condition that just sort of takes you along for uh, a pretty terrifying ride. There were times that I would go into a psychiatric emergency room and uh, I would be discharged right back to where I came from um, because our system was, you know, overburdened. Um, and they would just say, I'm sorry, uh, we don't have room for you. Um, those were really distressing moments. Having those things, uh, you know, a transitional back to a work program off of disability and an employer who was willing to be flexible and honor my needs for that, uh, was just so critical for um, getting through those first months. And from switching from that, that mindset that you have to use to get onto disability of like, wow, I really can't do anything, to switching into uh, you know, that new mindset of a person in recovery of saying, I can. Uh, the people who I had known for something like 10 years of chronic relapse in the recovery community uh, all started to say at the same time that something had changed. And I felt it too. Um, that, that gave me hope for change because it was something that was within me and it was real and it was different. When, you know, I was selected for a move from part-time to full-time in my employment, because that was a moment when I could really say that uh, my status as someone disabled could be terminated. For some reason. And there we go. Thank you very much, Cooper. Cooper's in the audience tonight. You know, it's so important to put a face and a voice on recovery. And Cooper, you are an inspiration. Our next speaker is Kelly Nomura, director of the King County Behavioral Health and Recovery Division. Kelly brings over 30 years of experience working in the local behavioral health community. Prior to being appointed as the division director, Kelly served as the division's interim director leading the division during a time of historical change. Kelly was instrumental in the creation of the King County Integrated Care Network. Now, this is one of a kind model. It's very unique to King County. It's a new partnership between King County Behavioral Health and Recovery Division and the provider agencies who serve the region's Medicaid population. And under Kelly's leadership, the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division also launched the Behavioral Health Administrative Services Organization, which provides both crisis and non-crisis services to all residents of King County. Please give a warm welcome to the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division Director, Kelly Nomura. Kelly?
Good evening and welcome. On behalf of the Department of Community and Human Services and the entire King County team, thank you to our state legislators, our guest speakers, the behavioral health agencies, our managed care organizations, and members of the recovery community for being here tonight. <clears throat> I apologize, Neil's losing his voice and so am I. So, <clears throat> no wrong door for care. Whether you go to your primary care doctor's office or you go to an addictions counselor, you should be able to access the care that you need. As Casey said earlier, King County is excited to be implementing integrated behavioral health and physical health care. But as integration started earlier this year, we realized that it's not as strong as it needs to be. Right now, we're focused on Medicaid funding and not other important programs or services that we know our residents need to access, and stay, access care and stay healthy. <clears throat> so to achieve our integration goals, King County and our behavioral health agencies co-developed an innovative King County Integrated Care Network, or KCICN, also known as KICN. I believe the KCICN partnership will help deliver a system where everyone has access to quality services. KCICN blends federal Medicaid dollars with state crisis dollars and over $180 million a year in local health and human services funds to secure and protect not only behavioral health services, but also critical supports that address other social determinants of health, such as housing and employment, for the county's lowest income residents. <clears throat> KCICN's strong public-private partnership delivers administrative simplification, value-based purchasing, and clinical integration for our clients, our providers, and our five managed care organization partners. And KCICN is strengthening partnerships with physical health care providers to ensure integrated care across the entire county. <clears throat> Tonight, we look to our state legislators to support enhanced integrated managed care through partnerships such as KCICN so that our shared constituents can have access to the quality services they need to stay healthy. I'd like to briefly outline the other legislative priorities that we have that will help us achieve our goals to ensure whole person care. First, and related to the transition to integration, we know that in 2021, currently separate behavioral health and physical health payment rates will be blended into one rate. As this happens, there must be strong transparency in rate setting and accountability mechanisms to ensure that Medicaid funding for behavioral health care is clearly identified and enhanced in the integrated financial approach. This will help eliminate the guessing game for providers, counties, managed care organizations, and the public. Second, <clears throat> you just heard Cooper describe his personal experience of being released back to his previous situation because the system just did not have room for him. We must continue to invest in community-based capacity to support care close to home. This requires the creation of local placements in the community that meet people's health needs and supports the ability to discharge from hospitals directly into low barrier housing and services. We support the plan to create local capacity for those discharging from the state psychiatric hospital, but we need thoughtful planning and funding to ensure, create, and sustain effective programs and services, including peer support services and peer-run programs. <clears throat> and it's crucial that we continue to invest in core rates so that our providers have a strong workforce to deliver the care that our communities need. And finally, King County has important federal priorities, including the need to promote coordinated care and safety by aligning substance use disorder confidentiality rules 
with HIPAA regulations. This is critical for the successful integration of behavioral health and physical health care. Common confidentiality standards will promote integration while protecting people's safety and privacy. The incredible personal stories that you hear tonight demonstrate the importance of investing in behavioral health services and funding access to treatment, housing, and supportive services to all in our community. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here tonight. Now I'd like to introduce one of our representatives from one of the King County ICN provider agencies, Claudia Delegri. <clears throat> Claudia is Claudia is president of behavioral health for CMAR Community Health Centers, which provides integrated physical and behavioral health services here in King County and across other counties in the state. Claudia is also a member of KCICN's executive committee and currently co-chair of the King County Mid Behavioral Health Sales Tax Fund Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming Claudia. Good evening, buenos noches. I just want to say thanks to legislators for being here tonight, listening to the needs of the behavioral health community, and also to the providers who are here present. But especially I want to say thanks to you, the people who are in recovery. I really believe that it's because of you that we are here together tonight. It's because of you that we have inspiration, and I have inspiration of my whole career of 25 years in behavioral health, finding reasons why to continue serving you. But we as a system have failed you many, many times. And I hope that tonight, our legislators and the people who are here are able to see the needs of the community and what do we need to do to resolve the gaps. For people who are not familiar with uh, CMAR Community Health Centers, some of the legislators are, uh, CMAR Community Health Center is an organization that provides integrated care. We don't only provide primary care, but we also provide behavioral health services, social abuse, we have residential facilities, maternity support services, housing, many, many services across Washington State. Currently, we provide services in, all, in many counties. We have 32 medical clinics. We have 42 behavioral health sites, and many of our sites are being integrated. One of the things I had noticed across Washington State is that with the changes that we had done for, in managed care and the changes that had happened to transform the behavioral health system, we have moved all the behavioral health resources into a managed care system. We have become a fully Medicaid system for behavioral health. But what happened with that, when we have a fully Medicaid system, all of those who are no Medicaid patients, all of those who are uninsured, all of those who are new in this country, do not have a way to receive services. We are down to crisis services, no Medicaid, Patients will receive crisis services, but they, they are not eligible for any other services in Washington State. But in here in King County, we're trying to do something different. And he, in King County, all the association of providers have come together as a network with King County and start saying, we're going to do something different. We're going to protect the system that provides services to behavioral health clients where we are not going to differentiate if you are a Medicaid or if you are a non-Medicaid patient. In our system, in our current system here in King County, a patient come to any of our facilities and I don't have to say, oh, you are non-Medicaid, let me tell you what you need to go, what are you eligible for. Here in King County, we're still able to provide Medicaid or non-Medicaid clients with the same type um, of services. In other parts of the county, we're really struggling to recover the cadence of payments that we have for residential treatment services. Here in King County, the King County, uh, uh, King County and the King County Network, because they contract directly with managed care, it has helped us to continue receiving all the residential payments in a regular basis. 
we as a network pro providers have been trying to do a lot of things to improve the system that we have here in King County. We're looking at utilization management as a provider network. We're looking to do more outreach, to try ways to engage our patients to make sure that anybody who had received a tier assignment is in our system receiving, receiving services. But we're also looking at metrics. We're looking at the metrics that managed care is interested in. Um, to make sure that we provide those metrics and start showing that our patients and behavioral health can get better. One of the things for me as a primary care provider as well as a behavioral health provider is being able to bridge the gap between primary care and behavioral health. So one of the things that we are putting a lot of effort is making sure that our metrics that we have in primary care carry over to the metrics of behavioral health. So we have patients that can get holistically well, where we have conditions, chronic conditions like uh, cardio, um, any, any issues with heart disease, uh, diabetes, any, any chronic diseases can also be in the same way treated in the way we're treating depression, we're treating anxiety. So we can treat our clients in all of the different chronic diseases in the same way. I invite you to support what we're doing here in King County. I believe that we are here together with all 46 providers can make people to get better, and we believe in recovery. I want to say thanks for being here tonight and to give him some time to speak about the experience as a provider. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Claudia. Now I'd like to introduce our first recovery speaker for the evening. Recovery is as recovery does. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joe Conniff. Good evening. Truly grateful to be up here tonight. Thanks for everybody showing up, <clears throat> supporting this. So my name's Joe. I'm a post 9-11 Navy veteran. I'm a father who enjoys time at the beach and skateboarding with his daughter. I'm a partner in a committed relationship. <clears throat> I'm a community organizer, a son, a brother, and an uncle. My recovery from a substance use disorder is the glue that holds my life together today. In my younger years, I watched daily as my mother struggled with chronic back pain and the overprescribing of her narcotic medication. This would often result in my going to work with my father, who worked for an organized crime family, and we would frequently be in bars or environments saturated with alcoholism and gambling. I assumed that difficulties in life could be managed through drugs or alcohol and wouldn't realize how inaccurate that was until I was 32 years old. As a teen, I began to drink and use cocaine as a means to cope, open up, and access new social circles. I joined the military at 19, hoping to receive structure and accountability, not realizing that I would carry my habits with me. I enjoyed brief success with the Navy as an aviation explosives tech during periods when I didn't have access to substances. My colleagues and I worked and played hard, and I would often be drunk or using drugs. And finally, after three years, my substance use caught up to me and I was discharged for cocaine use in 2005. I returned home to a supportive family, but was still unable to awaken to the fact that I alone was responsible for my career loss. Before long, I was back deep in addiction, 24 years old and living in a rundown drug house. One morning I woke to my close friend Pat in a heroin overdose. I called 911, gave them the address and the house filled with police seven minutes later. We had been under investigation, and I was immediately handcuffed to a chair while they searched the home. Pat died on the stretcher before his body left the house. I felt demoralized and utter helplessness of where my using had led me. I was unable to help Pat, or myself for that matter. I moved around the Midwest for the next two years, trying to shut out the pain and disbelief I felt around Pat's death. In 2008, I relocated to Seattle to pursue a relationship and inevitably continued my using there. Shortly thereafter, in 2011, my daughter was born, and I wasn't present for the birth. I was loaded, running from the fear of fatherhood and commitment. And by my daughter's second month, 
We were under the same roof, but for the next three years, I remained heavily intoxicated in between working hours. Due to my use, my home life had become increasingly difficult, and I left to the streets in late 2014. I dove headfirst into self-medicating my shame and remorse, was introduced to heroin, and it quickly became my master. I remained homeless for five months through the winter, hustling the drug in downtown Seattle to try to stave off dope sickness. I slept in doorways, I smoked cigarette butts off the ground, I rarely bathed, and I lost 40 pounds. I was arrested for the last time in 2015 for selling heroin to an undercover officer and was then arraigned in King County Drug Diversion Court. I was exhausted, I was tired of the jail stints and with the, in the withdrawals, and the road to sanity and sobriety seemed absolutely impossible. It was in custody that I ran into a guy I knew from the streets. He was in the program, sober, and appeared healthy and confident. He recommended I give myself a chance by opting to give the program a try. I accepted and went on to participate in the Transitional Recovery Program at the Mailing Regional Justice Center in Kent, a detox from heroin, and attended treatment classes and 12-step meetings in the jail. I also took part in the Incarcerated Veterans Program while there. I completed treatment in August of 2015 at the jail with 100 days of abstinence, and the obsession to use was gone. Through the Washington Department of Veterans Affairs, I received transitional supportive housing and obtained Medicaid, EBT, and Housing and Essential Needs Assistance. I became a member at the Recovery Cafe, attended yoga classes, <laughs> attended yoga classes and teacher training there, and embraced the community as well. I attended outpatient groups at Therapeutic Health Services, and between the tools of treatment and the accountability of Drug Diversion Court, I built a stable foundation for my recovery and reconnected with my father before he passed away three years ago. In April of 2017, I came back full circle and was hired by Therapeutic Health Services to serve as a resource specialist and peer counselor to drug court participants. For 16 years, I ran in the life as fast and as hard as I could. I endangered myself and others until the pain was great enough that I had the hope and desire to change. Services were available when I was ready, and it made my recovery possible. Thank you. Wow. How about that? <clears throat> recovery rocks. Thank you, Joe, for sharing your inspirational journey of recovery with us, what it was like, what happened, and most importantly, what it's like now. Thank you, Joe. Next, we have another personal story of experience, strength, and hope, and recovery. Please welcome to the stage Teresa Anderson Harper, and she's going to share her story with you. Hi, baby. <laughs> um, um, good evening. My name is Teresa Anderson Harper. I'm a mother. I'm a peer. I'm a survivor. This, this story of struggle, this is my story of struggle, hope, and recovery. I want to share with, with you a picture of me at 18, an 18-year-old me, a new mom with two kids in diapers. I went straight from a straight-A student to be entrapped in my home with a husband who physically and psychologically abused me on a daily basis. Drugs and violence were intertwined for him and with two babies, in care, two babies to care for and no path to safety, I was swept up in the, um, in the chaos of our home. By the age of 25 years, I was considered chronically dependent myself. Looking back, it was clear I was using drugs to self-medicate. It was, on, it was my only way to numb myself to the trauma of, of the chaos of my life. But to outsiders, it looked like a choice that I was choosing to make unknown to me. I also had a serious mental health condition that had never been diagnosed. 
After my periods of active use, I gave birth to eight children. Across my periods of active use, I gave birth to eight children and gave up three for adoption. I had run-ins with law enforcement that seemed never ending. I was in and out of jail for um, three or four months um, of the year, and I had three prison stays. And though the first few arrests were for drugs, the majority were, weren't for new crimes. They were for things like missed appointments with my corrections officer or simply being in a neighborhood where I happened to have lived because my home, the only home I had, um, happened to be in a part of town that law enforcement forbid me from entering because it was said to be a tra drug, high drug trafficking area. Mixed up in all of this were many attempts to get connected to treatment. I went to perinatal treatment services, I went to THS, I went to Sound, went to Valley Cities, Puget Sound Hospital, inpatient, outpatient, you name it, I tried it. Um, now that, that I'm a certified peer, I know recovery isn't linear. It's normal to need five, 10, or even 20 tries before you find a treatment option that really works. But I didn't know that back then. A never ending cycle of jail and treatment was crushing me. Family treatment court takes a wraparound approach where they gather, everyone gathers at one table. Um, everyone gathers at one table. All things are going on. So all things that are going on in a person's life are at the one table um, for the parents, um, including their kids. This, um, when I came into family um, treatment court, I was also uh, just entered uh, King County Drug Court. I was looking at two 10-year charges that were going to run concurrently. Um, this was life-changing for me, um, that the two were willing to work together. There was no more having to catch the bus to thousands of places or having to choose between the needs of my adult children, my younger ones, and myself. It took these providers and programs working together across boundaries to lift me up and keep me afloat long enough to make progress on the road to recovery. My real ability to heal and change came from participating in behavioral health services, intensive outpatient treatment, and DBT, which is an incredible mental health program that helps with emotion regulation. Through the co-occurring program at Valley Cities, I was taught about being duly diagnosed, what that meant for my substance abuse, and my mental health issues, and how one could trigger one and the other could trigger the other. An important part of my experience is that I sometimes hear voices. We used to think it was because of my substance use, but with help from the providers learned that it was a separate condition altogether. Through Valley Cities, I found a support group for people who hear voices, which helped me normalize my diagnosis and build new coping skills. My providers also encouraged me to build a healthy support, neck in my support network in my community and use it not just to better myself, but to support my children. You know what they say, it takes a village. It is the sum of all these programs and providers who helped me find stability. And now I'm proud to say I help that help be that village for others. After successfully, <laughs> after successfully reunifying with my children, I became a Washington State peer counselor. Trained facilitator, Trained facilitator in many things and was hired by a mental health agency to support families and parents in similar circumstances as mine. I have since received an award from the National Bar Association and in 2016 was hired as the Family Recovery Support Specialist for Family Treatment Court. The very same court. the very same program that changed everything for me. 
integrated wraparound behavioral health services paved the way on my road to recovery. And it's an honor to work every day on providing the same for others. Yeah, give it up. Give it up for Teresa. These personal stories of recovery are part of the evening that I certainly most look forward to. It's where hope meets gratitude. Next, we have our second recovery profile video featuring Shakota Sanchez. My name is Shakota Sanchez. I am 41 years old and I live in Seattle, Washington. I am a third generation alcoholic um, with mental health. I struggle with um, bipolar, schizoaffective disorder with audio hallucinations. Um, I have anxiety disorder. I didn't, I didn't tell anyone about it until I was in my 30s. Um, with the drinking, I, I started drinking when I was around 11. And then when I was 15, I, uh, I quit. I, I made a conscious effort to quit drinking. Um, I got involved in my, my culture. I'm Native American. I got involved in my culture, singing and dancing, powwow, and uh, that became really important to me. And uh, um, yeah, I became uh, clean and sober because of it. I started drinking again when I was 19 years old. I couldn't hide my depression anymore. Um, I started to talk about suicide and my friends and family started to get worried about me. I've been to treatment between inpatient and outpatient between 12 and 13 times. Um, and one of the main reasons is because um, the, first, the first group of times that I went, I had never really worked on my mental health. Um, like that's a that's a big component of it. Um, such a such a big component that a lot of people don't realize. Um, um, I didn't realize it for a really really long time. Um, I thought that it was all just. I thought it was all just don't drink, and everything will get better. I am currently on. Um, a housing program. I live, uh, I have my own apartment, um, but it's subsidized through a, a housing voucher. Um, I got involved in the uh, back to work program up at Harborview and I started, um, I started uh, recycling, I started volunteering up at Harborview and taking care of the recycling up. Um, they do the recycling for the entire hospital. And uh, it can lead you in a couple different directions. And, and I decided to, uh, to uh, inquire about DVR and going back to school. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I, uh, I was always kind of interested in welding. And so now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm I'm just starting my second year up at uh, at South Seattle in the welding fabrication program, and uh, and I love it. You know, it's a uh, I'm I'm doing really well. You know, getting back out there. You know, I didn't I wasn't I didn't know if I would ever, you know, be in this situation. You know, again, and uh, you know, here I am, and it's 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 really neat. Actually, right now, my proudest moment is um, is actually making the dean's list this last quarter. I'm happy what I'm what I'm doing right now. I'm I'm happy where I am. I'm happy with with my accomplishments. With I mean, with you know, with with where I'm at, and I know that that's because of my sobriety, and it's because I'm taking care of my mental health.
Thank you, Shakota. Shakota is also here with us in the audience tonight. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing that story. Now for our next recovery speaker, please welcome to the stage, Joey Wilson. My name is Joey Wilson. I have schizophrenia, PTSD, and a learning disability. When I was 19 years old, I was very lost. Most days were a constant worry for me. My days were dark and depressing, even with support from friends and family. That year, I went to Transform Resources, also known as TR. TR is a mental health agency that helps adults with severe mental illness. I stay in their assisted living facility and receive case management and medication assistance. But the medication was not working for me. Over the next three years, I spent many months in Harborview Hospital, including my 21st and 22nd birthday. I was finally prescribed a combination of medications that worked well for me. I wanted to live independently in my own apartment and learn that the only way I could get assistance was to be homeless. I began staying in a shelter temporarily to overcome that barrier. I got a housing voucher with ongoing services from TR. I've been in my own apartment and worked at Safeway for over five years now. TR gave me hope, they never gave up on me, and they helped give me a future. I'm happy to tell you I haven't gone back to, back to the hospital in the past six years. Now I'm attending the Occupational Life Skills Program at Bellevue College. It is the only program in the country to offer an associate degree for adults with a learning disability. I'm my, I'm my fourth and final year at OLS. After graduating, I would like to go on to get my bachelor's degree. I also have become a mental health advocate. People like me have to jump through so many hoops in the mental health system. The housing wait lists for people with serious mental illness are very long. There are not enough support in group homes for people to get their high school diploma or attend college. I want to make things easier for others like me. I feel it is my responsibility to speak up for those who don't have the ability to advocate for themselves. A recent accomplishment of mine is testifying for and helping pass a legislative bill concerning health care for workers with disabilities. The bill raises the income cap limit and eliminates age restrictions so people can keep their Medicaid while advancing their careers and reaching their full potential. I would like to leave you with some last words. No matter what your situation or circumstance is, keep hope alive and never be afraid to speak up because your voice matters. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joey. That, my friends, is recovery in action. Our final recovery speaker this evening is Aaron Olinson. And, uh, and apparently he has a, a cheering section. <laughs> yeah. 
Good evening. I would like to start off by saying how truly blessed I am and truly grateful to be able to share my story with you guys tonight. Um, this is probably one of the highest points in my recovery. And if, excuse me if I get a little emotional, but thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. I was born and raised in Tacoma to a very normal household. My dad worked very hard as a union carpenter and my mother was a stay at home mom. By the age of 10, I realized that my dad had a secret. He smoked marijuana. My curiosity grew quickly. If dad does it, it must be cool, right? Before I knew it, I was sneaking into a stash to try it. Soon I was smoking marijuana on a daily basis and experimenting with other drugs. By the ninth grade, I had tried, mo tried most drugs you can think of. My dad injured his back in the early 90s and had many back surgeries. He had bottles and bottles of prescribed pain pills. Some friends educated me on the power and the value of these drugs and I started stealing his pills, using and selling as many as I could. By sophomore year, I was fully addicted to opiates, along with dabbling in cocaine and methamphetamines. I graduated high school by the skin of my teeth. I started yelling, after high school, I started selling large quantities of pot and Oxycontin. I had my first real run-in with the law at 19. I was sentenced to Kitsap County Drug Court and had my first taste of inpatient treatment. I graduated drug court, but it wasn't long until I started drinking and the cycle started again. Drinking led me to parties, which led me to meth, which led me right back to Oxy. At the time, Oxycontin was much harder to come by and much more expensive. So my dealer showed me this new stuff, heroin. And that's when my life spun completely out of control. The next six years of my life were absolute hell on earth. I was in and out of jail, treatment, prison, hospitals. I had health issues like infections and blood clots from IV, IV heroin and meth use. I tried every which way to get recovery. Detox, 30, 60, 90, six month treatment programs. I tried Suboxone and Methadone. These years of my life looked like this. Get a job, start to rebuild my life, and then tear it all down because I could not seem to get recovery for anything. This wreaked havoc on my family. They were happy when I was incarcerated or in treatment because I was safe for myself. And looking back, I was, actually sa I was actually the happiest too because I was safe for myself. In October of 2016, my girlfriend at the time, who has since passed from this disease, found this place in Seattle called Cijanar, Seattle Drug and Narcotic Center. <laughs> A long-term residential behavior modification program with work therapy. The turning point of my story came in the bathroom, of a McDonald's, a bathroom stall of a McDonald's. I was experiencing full-blown withdrawal. I had blood stains all over my jeans. For close to an hour, I tried to find a vein. I was so desperate to feed my disease, I had literally mutilated myself, blood dripping off my arms onto the tile. I started crying in disgust with myself. In that moment, I knew something had to change. I arrived at CGNR after medical detox on December 12th of 2016. It was either die or put everything into this. CGNR is not for the first time treatment goers. It's considered the last house on the block for people like me. You work at a recycling plant where there are countless opportunities to develop your work skills, from forklift training to get your commercial driver's license. At night, you participate in all the treatment and therapy groups. You do not complete the program until you have a full-time job, money saved, recovery housing set up, which most treatment centers do not require. I started, very, I started at the very bottom, working swing shift at the recycling plant. The people at CGNR saw something in me I did not see in myself at the time. When our, when our company started working with a larger company, my director and the vice president of Cellmark observed me and said, that's the guy, he's going to run, run this. Sitting down with my boss and being offered the promotion of plant manager was an emotional experience. For the first time, I was able to showcase my abilities and it transformed my life. Now I, now I work side by side with clients in the program teaching and training them how to operate equipment, how to function day-to-day -day in recovery, and most importantly, share my experience and show them that there is hope. Today, I have a life I never, I never could have dreamed of. I teach, train, and mentor those that are where I once was. I know they can have a different life if they want it because I am proof that it's possible. Yeah. I absolutely love and cherish my job and everything CGNR has given me. I have friends I call family, I have my family in my life, I pay my bills and I get to give back. I wanted something different. I didn't know what it was or how to get it, but CGNR showed me how, and I am so truly at this grateful at this life and recovery that I have today. Thank you.
Thanks, Oren, and thank you very much to all of the people who had the courage to stand up and, and share their stories. You know, when we think of substance abuse disorders, a lot of people think of people who are still sick and suffering, people on the street, people who are in, in desperate need. But the reality is the bright side of addiction is recovery. And now our legislators are going to get a chance to respond to what they have heard tonight in our very, very special evening. Legislators, we would welcome your comments. We ask you to please take about maybe one minute each. <laughs> You're ahead of me. <laughs> We'd particularly be interested to hear your thoughts about what you've heard during tonight's program or perhaps the earlier roundtable discussions and your priorities around mental health or substance use recovery for 2020. Who would like to start? Is this on? You're on. I guess first I'd like to um, just introduce myself. I'm Lisa Callen. I was running late, got stuck in traffic coming back from Chehalis, but I'm very glad to be here and catch the tail end part ah. and want to make sure that um, everybody knows that I'm accessible and would love to hear your stories and connect with you. So one of the, I serve on the Human Services Early Learning Committee and the K-12 Education Committee and on the Capital Committee. And one of the things that um, is near and dear to me is making sure that we have all of the resources we need um, for our youth and want to work hard with um, school-based behavioral health and mental health supports, making sure we're doing what we can do to end our youth in crisis and making sure they have the supports they need when and where they need them. Thank you. Okay. Rebecca Saldana again, 37th Legislative District. And um, one of the things that I, I serve on labor commerce, and um, that is where we um, regulate all of the alcohol, um, cannabis, vaping, um, and gambling. And so actually, I, would, I don't think we hear enough from the community that's pre present here and would love to hear that as we're opening things up, as we're looking at policy, um, you know, what do you want to see? I will say on the two T21, when we raised the age to 21, um, we um, made sure that 18 to 25, um, or 18 to 21 um, are not going to be criminalized, but we didn't go back and fix that for 18 and under. And so that is a piece of legislation I'm working on. I would love your support. And I can't wait to um, come and learn more and come and visit some more of your sites. So thank you. Great. Thanks for coming. Um, good evening again. Uh, Noelle Frame, state representative here for the 36th district. Um, I have the privilege of serving along with Representative Callan as the vice chair for the Human Services and Early Learning Committee. And I also co-chair the Children's Mental Health Work Group. Um, I thought just I'd take my one minute to run really quickly through a couple of accomplishments, but also what's coming up and the things we're working on, because I think they really um, are in line with a lot of what we heard tonight. Um, legislation that we passed this last year, we uh, gave parents more access to information to help um, their minor children uh, get into treatment when they need it. Uh, we were able to extend uh, behavioral health um, training to our um, educators by designating one of their professional learning days uh, to be for behavioral health. Um, we have a plan in place, we're working towards a plan for early intervention psychosis. We have coaches for our early achievers program to help do early detection for little ones. And moving forward, um, what we heard tonight is interest in expanding the workforce, increasing rates. Um, these are subcommittees along with the school-based behavioral health that Representative Callan mentioned that we are actively working on and recommendations will be developed at our December 3rd meeting. So lots of work underway. Thank you tonight Good for stuff. all the feedback. Good stuff, thank you. So hi, I'm Bob Hasegoff, Senator from the 11th. And so many thoughts go through your head when you hear the stories. Um, one piece that might be missing is the family support systems that um, I think that Good point. Find, get no funding through the system yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. And I think that that's a huge gap that really needs to be filled. Uh, but I'm not an expert on this, and it'd be presumptuous for me to try and offer solutions. You all are the experts. You're living on this uh, through this day to day, or you're professionals dealing with it day to day. So I rely on your advice for what you need. I see my job more as trying to find the funding to provide those services that are necessary. So yeah. I need to hear from you what the funding uh, programs that you need. 
uh, what's working, uh, what might be changed in the system if it's not working. And I, I would encourage you, though, to think systemically and holistically about the problem because funding is a problem not just for behavioral health areas, mm -hmm. but it's throughout society. And we have some serious problems in society. I see um, actually society as a massive um, symptom of what we as individuals are going through. And society is suffering from mental health issues holistically right now. There's greed and, and yeah. uh, what, uh, what do you, Trumpism. I, I just use that <laughs> to put it bluntly. So um, we have to look at ways to deal with not just the back end of what the consequences are, but trying to solve some of these bigger social problems too. So I just encourage you to keep that in mind as we're moving forward. Good points. Tina Orwell from the 33rd Legislative District. Thank you for being tonight. Uh, the stories are so powerful, so mm. from the heart, and yeah. uh, incredible amount of courage, so thank you. Um, I'm teaming up with a lot of my colleagues in University of Washington to really look at uh, suicide prevention and training. Uh, I think we need to support our workforce. I think it's really important that people get the training, whether it's DBT, dialectic behavioral therapy, or other types of training. Um, yay! <laughs> and also um, to make sure that we're doing reimbursement to allow people to have living wages that do this work, including our, our peer counselors. So, a lot of work ahead. Thanks, Claire Wilson again from the 30th. Um, had some great table conversations, so I think I'm gonna speak about that. In the South County area, uh, transportation is a huge issue, and I sit on transportation. is something that we've been talking a lot about. We have north-south, but we have nothing that goes to east and west, and so as we think about access to service and support, it's not there. Also think about resources for families and the fact that families have to leave the area to get what they need. Um, and there's not enough resources within the community, although there's a huge need. And the further you are from the urban core, uh, the further are you, uh, you are away from those services and support. So those are huge issues to me. Um, also, I work in early learning, so everything happens in the context of families, and that's however you define that constellation. And I also am very concerned about making sure we're looking at our um, communities of veterans, that we're looking at our LGBTQ communities, that we're looking at those communities that um, are impacted by intersectionality and tend to be even further away um, services and support. So those are the kinds of things I'll be looking at. And please reach out and thank you for all the folks from the 30th. To, I have your list. Thanks. Great. Frank. Yeah. Uh, my name is Frank Chop. Uh, I want to thank all those who spoke tonight and thanks for the crowd tonight. It's very important you tell your stories. Uh, we've made a lot of progress the uh, last uh, few years here on uh, priorities like the Behavioral Health Institute, the Behavioral Health Teaching Hospital, supportive housing for people in recovery, that's extremely important, as well as investments in workforce. But briefly, I want to talk about my sister. She's 75 years old and has been suffering from bipolar disease for about, well, decades. And the other day, actually last night, I had dinner with her and she said, Frankie, by the way, you're not gonna call me Frankie. <laughs> That's for my sister. At any rate, she says, Frankie, my new drug for treatment is $6,000, excuse me, $5,000. And I figured, well, per month, right? Or no, per year. And she said, no, per month. $5,000 for a prescription to treat her disease, 60,000 a year. Now she has insurance, her copay is 250 a month, and she's got a loving family and a lot of support network. Uh, but what we need is a, a different dynamic about this because there are people dying on the street, as you well know. So I'd like to have, I'll propose a bill, it'll take a while to get done, a bill so that a doctor or a nurse practitioner can write a prescription for a home, a supportive home with supportive services. Wow. Because in actuality, that, rental voucher or partnership with a nonprofit housing provider is going to be less expensive for the old society, but also in terms of comparing it with things that we already assume we're going to pay for, like prescription drugs and other right. things like that. So uh, I hope you work with me to figure out how to do this. Uh, we need some input to make sure it actually works. But someday, 
we got to end this homelessness and do it in a way that makes sense in comparison to everything else we're doing. Thank you very much. Well said. Well said. Uh, good evening again. Patty Cooter, State Senator from the 48th. And I chair the Housing Stability and Affordability Com uh, Committee. And people who suffer from mental illness and mental health issues uh, were a unique population that we had a working session on, talked about the unique challenges that they have fi finding housing. So I'm happy to help you, Frankie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that was coming. With your bill, um, but it is, it is something uh, that we are looking at in terms of we need to make sure that, that everyone has a home, but those who have unique challenges, we need to make sure that you know, there are wraparound services and uh, the support that's needed, permanent support of housing in a lot of cases for, for folks uh, who need that. Um, and I also just want to briefly mention a conversation that I had at my table uh, regarding HIPAA laws and mm. that they can be super restrictive sometimes when it comes to parents who want to help their children, their adult children, uh, who are suffering from mental health issues. And this is an issue I've heard before. I know there was legislation proposed on that and I'll be looking into that too. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, Mona Doss from the 40th, 47th District. Um, I'm one of the newest members of the legislature. And so what I spent my interim doing is, um, along with Patty, uh, Senator Couture, um, I vi I'm vice chair for the Housing Affordability Committee and we spent a lot of time um, out in the community in Yakima and Walla Walla and Spokane and all around to just see what the best solutions are out there. I'm so touched by the stories that, we sh that you all shared tonight. Thank you so much for your courage and bravery. I know how hard it is to share those deeply personal stories. And they help me understand what's working and where we, where we need to go. So I look forward to uh, working with all my colleagues here to make sure that we end this cycle um, and keep going. Thank you. Roger Goodman, uh, Neil, you and I worked together, what, uh, 17 years ago. Or longer. Yeah. I, actually, I actually was the MC of this event uh, years yeah, ago as the legislative right. chair for what used to be called the uh, alcohol, it was Al Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Administrative Board before right, it became right. the Behavior Hall. And there weren't very many people in the audience back then. The stigma was so strong. Family members didn't show up to support their loved ones. And look at you today. We have this huge venue. Yeah. Right? I now serve as chair of the House Public Safety Committee with jurisdiction over the criminal justice system. And I'm working as hard as I can to decriminalize mental illness and to decriminalize addiction. We have too many people suffering on the streets who are arrested, end up in jail, and after jail there's no warm handoff. Yeah. And so, actually with my colleague Lauren Davis here, who you hear from in a moment, we have gotten some funding, grant programs to divert those who are suffering from behavioral health uh, crisis uh, a, a before arrest, away from jail, to therapeutic alternatives, and if they are in jail, the warm handoff uh, to a therapeutic alternative. And now working with the courts, so that those who come before the court can have assessment on site, can have a peer navigator to take them through their journey uh, back to functioning properly in society. So. Thank you, Roger. Hi, Bill Ramos again from the 5th. Uh, I, I just thank you all for, for everything you've done. But most important, what I'm seeing here is access. When you need it, access is the critical piece that we just have to make sure it's there um, and remove the stigma. Um, today, interesting because I'm on the college uh, committee and we just started a task force to look at what we can do to improve uh, the counselors that are available in the colleges and technical, co uh, technical colleges we have out there so that we can catch things as quickly as we can and help students that are in place there now that need help. So we'll be working on that. Thank you very much. I'm Tana uh, Sen, once again, and I chair the Human Services and Early Learning Committee. And when I think about that committee, I think upstream. And that is what I'm very focused on. Uh, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that um, kiddos get the social emotional learning and the infant mental health care that they need. Um, and it seems like a lot of, I'm sure you guys all understand infant mental health, but we even know that's that kind of connection between the mom and the baby uh, and social emotional learning skills and the development for self-regulation 
giving ourselves, uh, giving our young people the tools that they need to be resilient as they move up for li in, uh, across life. So we're looking to expand mental health uh, consultation for childcare because kids get kicked out of preschool oh. uh, even more than they do out of K-12. So talk about going upstream and problems at an early, early age. Uh, the other issue that I just want to mention that we talked about a lot at our table is also the need for diversifying the workforce uh, so that people are able to talk to and get treatment from people from their own communities. And uh, that's another thing that I'm very focused on. Thanks. Hi, I'm Reuven Carlisle, Senator for the 36th District. For a number of years, uh, I've been trying to close a tax break worth about $40 million for three of the largest prescription drug warehousing companies in the nation and use that money for opioid abuse treatment services. My goal was inspired by Joey's comments where he said, keep hope alive. One of my goals this year is to work with uh, Representative Davis to close that tax break and invest those dollars in direct services here in our state. Nicely said. Jerry Paulette, 46th District. Um, the courage that you share your stories with leads me to think about the struggle we all have in changing community attitudes. There are way too many residents of King County, progressive King County, and of course throughout this state, who think that housing first is something they need to oppose because they're afraid of the stigma of how someone who is in recovery will, might live in a supportive housing unit near them. We've got to change that by showing that their family members, their loved ones, are the people who are going to be in the community next to them and that they know someone and someone they care about who they want to have housed, that's how we make the change. So we have to share that at Thanksgiving dinner. We have to share that in our community groups. We've got to get out there and share it in our churches, in our synagogues, in our mosques, and talk about housing first is for all of us. It's not just for someone else who we want to sweep under the table. And we got to, what we have to sweep away is the meanness of people who say, not here, and the meanness of people who say, God, we're not going to allow to any supportive medical community centers, safe injection sites in our community, but we don't understand that if you don't, you're spreading the d disease and illness and offering no hope of getting people into treatment so we've got to say, let's do it here. That's our message. And Love. let's do it now. So I, again, want to just thank everybody who shared their stories of recovery and everybody who has their own story of recovery uh, that, 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 that they didn't get to share on stage, but they're thinking about and that they're sharing with their friends and family and coworkers and loved ones. Um, it really matters, not just that we, the legislators, and, and you, the, the recovery community, share these stories with each other. We need to share these stories out with the world because we hear so much in the, in the media about um, when somebody is let down by the system, when the system fails and somebody doesn't get treated treatment and recovery in time. Um, but there are so, that's not a complete, and it's important that we hear those stories, but that's not a complete picture because there's so many people in every, every person in this room, one of our lives, whether it's you or one of your loved ones, um, who has been through recovery and because of the good work of the community organizations in this space and the good work of King County and the state of Washington, that those, that the, the resources for that recovery um, is po are, are available and that the recovery is possible. So we have to keep sharing these stories, not just with each other, but with the whole community so people know that it's not just failures, that there are so many uh, stories of success of people recovering from uh, the terrible illness of addiction uh, and going on to do amazing things. So uh, just thank you again for being here and, and let's continue this work uh, and sh share these stories with the whole world. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, Shelly Kloba representing the first legislative district and I sit on the Commerce and Gaming Committee in the House and one of the ways that that 
uh, overlaps with some of the stories and things we've heard tonight uh, is around problem gambling. And uh, mm -hmm. there can be debate on whether or not it's a, an addiction. It certainly is uh, something that can lead to tremendous financial and personal uh, ruin. And so I've been very concerned about that, serving on Commerce and Gaming. And so two things that are uh, some good news. Last year, we passed a bill that creates a um, gambling self-exclusion. So this is an opportunity. Yay, someone knows what that is. If you are someone who struggles to uh, control any of your gaming activity, uh, this system would allow you to uh, fill out one form in one place that is not in a casino that you could then uh, be barred from access to gambling at other sites. We're hoping to make sure that eventually it is um, for everything across the state. So that work is uh, in rulemaking right now. And then the other part that I'm really excited about, and, and I think that coming to this uh, particular event several years in a row, uh, it influenced how I thought about it. Uh, we passed a budget proviso that creates a problem gambling task force. It was, I think, a, a, a fairly agreed upon notion that we don't fully understand the uh, number of people in our state who, who are affected by a gambling disorder. And so it started with, we need to find out, number one, how many people are affected, but also, how, is our, the amount of treatment that we're doing appropriate and adequate? The general thinking is no, it's not, but we're digging deeper into that. And the, the part that I wanna thank you all about is about recovery and making me understand recovery and that it is possible. And when, I, when we wrote this budget proviso, we specified that we're looking at prevention and treatment and recovery services that are available in this state and what we hope to do. So I really want to thank you for the work that you do and just the, the daily lives that you lead that are brave and valiant in the face of some really difficult things. So thank you. Nice. Again, I'm Nicole Macri representing the 43rd Legislative District. Um, in addition to my work in the legislature, I work at DESC, the Downtown Emergency Service Center, and um, so have great gratitude and respect for all the folks who spoke tonight, all the folks who showed up, and all the people um, who are working to bring stability back to their own lives, um, many of whom I work with every single day. Um, I want to um, say that I work on a number of things in the legislature, um, access to housing among um, the top things that I think um, are essential. Um, and I really am grateful for the comments tonight about people sharing their stories of um, finding housing and how important having a stable home has meant to their own recovery. Um, I heard a mention of the Housing and Essential Needs Program, which is an issue that I'm going to work on again for the third year in a row um, in the legislature in 2020 to make sure that the many people living with behavioral health um, disabilities have access um, to housing that they can afford um, and the support that they need. Um, I also work a lot on access to health care, and I was grateful to hear comments about um, acknowledging that many people in our community don't, still don't have access to health care, um, and we're going to continue to work on that because um, that access to health care is the pathway to recovery. Um, I have been coming to this um, forum for many years, and I, um, like Roger, was reflecting on when there were uh, many, a lot fewer people, and actually not as many young people, so I want to thank all the young yeah. people um, who have showed up. Um, we had a landmark year last year in the legislature. It was truly historic. Um, the um, policies and investments that we made in behavioral health, that was only possible because of thousands of advocates from across the state pushing us to do the right thing. Um, so keep at it, keep doing it. And finally, I want to um, 
acknowledge that more people in King County died of methamphetamine related overdoses um, than any other kind of substance use related overdoses. Um, and we as a legislature need to get smarter and think more broadly about substance use disorder engagement and treatment and make sure that we're creating a system that is flexible and responsive to the, to the needs that people are actually experiencing in our, in our community. So I'm looking forward to doing that as well. Thank you. Again, Jeannie Cole-Wells, King County Council Member, District 4, and we are in that here. And I am the council representative on the Mid Advisory Committee, and I chair the Health, Housing, Human Services Committee. And this year, I'm chairing the King County Board of Health. And in all three ways, I am working very hard in everything that we've been talking about here tonight. A year and a half after I started on the council, my 23-year-old nephew died of an overdose. And a year after that, his father, my husband's brother, died from alcoholism and uh, substance abuse as well. So it's become very personal to me. And there are two things that I really uh, found very poignant, well, a lot of things, in what was said tonight in the recovery stories. But certainly the references to those individuals who have experienced homelessness. And our council right now, especially council members McDermott and Balducci and I, have been working on getting through the legislation uh, to create a King County Regional Homelessness Authority to consolidate Seattle's efforts and the county's efforts. It's been really tough to get that through the King County Council. We're hoping we can do so by December 11th, our last meeting for the year. So stay tuned on that. The second thing that I found, um, it, it's really so poignant to me, was the, the, the stories about uh, the recovery that people are experiencing, fortunately. I wish that individuals who take part in Safe Seattle and Moms Against Seattle, and all the individuals around this region who thought the Como television, so-called, whatever it was, documentary, so-called, uh, Seattle is dying, was accurate. The stigmatizing, the stereotyping have just been horrible. And if they could hear the stories that we heard tonight and the many other stories that others could be telling, I would hope that would make a difference. So I, just like others have said here tonight, it's really important for you to tell the stories. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Sharon Tomiko Santos, and um, I want to begin by uh, again thanking all of you who shared your stories uh, with us. I think, to me, one of the strongest um, images that came out in your stories um, is that um, you are sons and daughters, you are parents, you are spouses and partners, you are friends, and um, you are heroes. Um, because one of the things, um, that clearly, what your stories were centering on was hope. Um, and it was about um, removing that stigma that is such a barrier for so many of us. Um, whose family members um, experience um, mental health, substance abuse issues. And so I, I want to thank you because you're, you're heroes. You, you tell me that success is possible. And you give me hope. Uh, last year I talked uh, about my nephew who um, we didn't realize was experiencing mental health issues until he tried to commit suicide. 
But today I want to talk more about my grandson who lived with me, who came to live with me after he was discharged from jail. He needed a safe place to stay. And as many of you have said over and over again, this is not a linear path. And for those of you in the audience who are family members, you know how hard it is to see your loved one every time trying to climb up and to fall back down, to climb up again and fall back again. So you've given me hope that my grandson will eventually reach that level of success that all of you are experiencing in recovery. And so I want to thank you for that. And I especially want to give a call out to ACRS, who's in the house. I see you, Michael. And I know jo Joseph was here as well. Because it's so important to have our community-based organizations that are uh, providing culturally competent care for our individuals. Because every person who suffers from substance abuse and mental health issues is a different person. Yeah. They have different needs. And we have to meet those needs on an individual basis. And so I, I have to really express my gratitude for ACRS and for all of those who are providing that individualized need for each and every person in King County. And let me just end with this, because I know it's a little over a minute, but somebody talked about um, integrative health, the mental and the physical health, and how glad we are that that's the direction in which we're moving. But I also want to say we have to not just talk about an integrative, integrative health with mental and physical health. We have to talk about integrative systems because you have to have the health care, you have to have the housing, you have to have the economic opportunities, the job training, you have to have education, you have to have family support. All of these pieces work together. And so the thing that I want to end with is a piece that came out of our table conversation. And I'll, I'll leave with a um, Pacific Islander quotation that in order to move where you want to go, all paddles have to be in the water. And so let's make sure that all of our paddles are in the water. Thank you. Yeah. Hi again, everyone. Lauren Davis, representing the 32nd Legislative District. <laughs> so behavioral health is actually the primary reason I'm standing up here. It's the reason I ran for office. I identify as a person in recovery from mental health challenges. I am the daughter of a parent who's been in active addiction my whole life. Um, my best friend, Ricky, tonight's photographer, celebrated seven years in long-term recovery earlier this year. And <laughs> And that's so much of why I'm here. My day job is I serve as the executive director of the Washington Recovery Alliance. You may have seen the purple t-shirts. Um, that's us. And just want to mention um, three issues. There are so many. But the first one, I, I work a lot in the legislature around what we call recovery support services. So all the things that help a person stay in recovery and, and get from early recovery into long-term recovery, things like recovery housing, things like peer support, things like family education, things like access to education and employment. And I commend my colleagues for investing substantially in these areas. We passed a recovery housing bill unanimously that had operating budget and capital budget attached to it. Well, the capital budget was separate, but we, um, we you invested in family education. And one thing that came out of my constituent conversations, I had a, a constituent at my table who has worked for six years with Sound, one of our provider agencies, as a mental health therapist and is leaving not by heart but because of, of the wages and low wages and inability to, to live in this community and work. And so we've just got to do something about Medicaid rates. And deeply committed to that. And the last thing I'll say is um, there is a mom here tonight who lost her child, my age child, a month ago to a, an overdose, a preventable overdose. And her child, Chelsea, we had her twice in the hospital and in detox begging for treatment, and we failed her. We failed her child. 
and her child was taken off life support about a month ago. And so I'm really proud and, and grateful for Representative Cody and looking forward to working with her on a bill to facilitate immediate access to inpatient treatment so that we never lose another precious child. Thank you. So Eileen Cody from the 34th, and I'm the old timer up here. So I just want to say to you all that when I was first started in the legislature, and I've been on health care the whole time, the word recovery was not used mm -hmm. with, in mental health, nor in addiction. And it was not until after about 2003 that we finally started hearing about recovery and that it entered the dialogue in Olympia. So that you all should take credit for that, the changes that have happened in that. But I'm giving you one more challenge, and it goes with represent, what Representative Pellett said. We have got a huge problem that people think we should have. They'll say, oh, we want more treatment, we want more treatment. And you know, if you go to town halls, they'll all talk about it. But they don't want them in their neighborhood. So we have to talk to people about the fact that you can't have treatment and not have it in the neighborhood. It's just crazy. So start talking to people about it. I'm Joe McDermott, serve on the King County Council, and will and pledge to continue, inspired by your stories tonight, to work with Councilmember Cole Wells and others on the council to deliver that unified regional governing body to coordinate our efforts on homelessness within the region. And as a King County Council member, continue supporting that integrated health care, that behavioral health, mental health, and physical health recognizing we're caring for one person. Thank you very much. I salute each and every one of our amazing legislators. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Before we conclude, we'd like to quickly thank all the legislators and the elected officials, the legislative staff, our 57 co-sponsoring organizations, all the volunteers helping us tonight, people in mental health and substance use recovery, behavioral health providers, health and human service partners, other community members, thanks so much. And a special shout out to Amanda Flatley, who organized this amazing event tonight. Amanda, you did a great job. And remember, my closing words, the bright side of addiction and mental illness is recovery. Pass it on because recovery is as recovery does. Good night, everybody.